Man, what's up, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of EOS. It's 1090 Jake, man. I'm rocking with y'all, and y'all rocking with me. And for this video, we're going to be speaking on Florida rapper Boston Richie and his paperwork being exposed. December 28th, 2022. Florida based TV would post to Instagram claiming Kodak Black's newly signed artist NFL 2 Wop revealed paperwork on rising Florida rapper Boston Richie. The three minute live stream would show a piece of paper from what appears to be an interview with someone only titled as Witness 3. It states on June 23rd, 2016, Witness 3 gave an interview that was recorded entirely after being arrested for loitering and prowling. Witness 3 was described as being somewhat hostile and initially denied telling James Foster about an incident in which a Northside subject had threatened him with a firearm. Now in 2 Wops Live, 2 Wops says Boston Richie's real name is Jalen Foster and James Foster is Boston Richie's father. How the police knew Richie told his father about the incident is still unknown. After several minutes of questioning, Witness 3 stated the incident did occur and identified the subject that threatened him as a young black male with the street name Wig. Investigators previously noted that DeAndre Wiggins nickname is Wig. Witness 3 was shown a photograph of Wig and confirmed it was DeAndre Wiggins that had threatened him. According to Witness 3, the incident happened two months prior. He had been in the Frenchtown neighborhood visiting a female identified as Latavia Hill. Leandre Wiggins arrived and confronted him, and Witness 3 indicated that the issue was the fact that he was at a north side location, but he's from the south side. He said that Deandre Wiggins threatened him and acted as if he had a handgun in his waistband. Witness 3 maintained that the Keith Street homicide was not a result of this altercation or any other criminal gang activity that he may be involved in. Now, 2 Wop would show a second picture to the live stream to confirm Boston Richie or Jalen Foster is in fact Witness 3. The paper itself reads, Witness List. The following individuals are identified in supplemental reports by Witness Number. In the case of Jalen Foster, his identity is concealed only in instances where he provides information pertaining to possible motive. Witness 3 would read Jalen Foster, his birth date which shows him as being 19 years old at the time, and an address on Keith Street, the same street a homicide occurred. Now I posted to my Instagram saying, y'all know I'm finna look into this. And Boston Richie would reply to my story saying, look up the case, it's under DeAndre Wiggins. Searching for the case, I'd find that a then 24 year old DeAndre Wiggins, or Wig, was arrested for homicide and possession of a weapon by a convicted felon. On June 4th, 2016 at 419 in the morning, the Tallahassee Police Department responded to a home on Keith Street, the same address as the one listed for Boston Richie on the witness list. Officers located 24-year-old DeVaris Bass laying in the front yard of his residence. He'd been shot multiple times and was transported to a nearby hospital where he died a short time later. DeVaris was a rapper who was originally from Orlando and went by the name D Slug or Slugger. He was also Boston Richie's cousin. Investigators would find five 9mm shell casings near where his body laid and on-scene witnesses who were all known to police said that after the shooting, two black males ran on foot down Keith Street to a white Buick that fled at a high rate of speed. Investigators would learn in the following days that two separate incidents occurred only hours before the murder and were all related. Originally lying to police, a man admitted he was carjacked for his white Buick during a drug deal between midnight and 1 a.m. Two witnesses would later be interviewed and one would identify Wig as the suspect. Tallahassee police have Wig identified as a member of the Northside Doghouse Gang. At 1.49 a.m., police responded to a shooting scene where a gold Nissan had been struck by gunfire and five 9mm shell casings would be recovered, forensics concluding that it was the same ammunition from the homicide scene and fired from the same handgun. 
The Buick would be recovered by police the same day of the murder, and 10 days later after a warrant was signed, forensics would find Wiggs' finger and palm prints on the outside of the driver's side door, along with another man's prints. June 13th, nine days after the murder, police pulled over a vehicle with Wig and Wig's girlfriend inside. He'd be arrested for possession of cocaine, and his cell phone would be inventoried at the Leon County Jail during booking. A warrant for the cell phone would be signed days later, and his text history would reveal he stopped communicating two hours before the carjacking, shooting, and murder. He texted his girlfriend after 10 a.m. saying he wanted to talk about his problems, and she replied saying, I told you I ain't want to see that gun no more, and you just go ham with it last night. Further text would reveal a conversation with someone who would soon become known as Witness 4. Wig texted Witness 4, don't tell anyone what I just told you, cause she trying to find out. Witness 4 cautioned Wig to just lay low for a couple days, then come back to the hood. June 22nd, investigators interviewed Witness 1, who was a close associate of Wig. And while the name is blacked out of the witness list, it's said to be Wig's girlfriend. In a sworn statement, Witness 1 admitted to being present on Dunn Street the day of the shooting and observed Wig with a black handgun. Witness 1 watched Wig fire into the gold Nissan before driving off with another man in the white Buick. Witness 1 didn't speak to Wig until the following day and asked him about the Keith Street murder. Wig would claim he was at his house at the time it happened. In the following days, Witness 1 would travel with Wig, where Wig met with Witness 2 to sell a handgun. Investigators would interview Witness 2 next, who according to the witness list is named James Lamb and goes by the nickname Murder. Murder is a close associate of Wig and told investigators Wig tried to sell him a black handgun for $50, but because of the low price he assumed it had been used in a crime and denied it. Murder then said Wig appeared desperate and asked where he could get rid of the gun, so Murder pointed to a body of water. The following day, investigators interviewed Witness 3, who according to the witness list is Jalen Foster, who went by the nickname Bussa, but we know him as Boston Richie. Investigators would note Richie was a relative of the homicide victim and lived at the residence where the murder happened. Richie reluctantly recounted an incident that occurred approximately two months prior involving Wig. Richie stated he'd been in the French town neighborhood when the defendant threatened him with a firearm because he was associated with the South Side. Roughly a week later, investigators interviewed Witness 4, who according to the witness list is Trey Moore and goes by the nickname Loudy or Loud. Another associate of Wig, Loud confirmed to investigators when he texted Wig to lay low, it was related to the homicide. Loud told investigators him and Wig spoke in person and Wig confessed to the homicide. After the conversation is when Wig texted him telling him not to tell anyone else. Loud told investigators he saw Wig at 1 a.m. before the murder. He was traveling in a white Buick and told Loud he was going to the south side. Loud wouldn't see Wig till the following day where Wig made a reference to catching a body. Loud asked him about it and Wig said that he had gone to Key Street to rob someone and he shot him multiple times. Loud knew Wig had previous altercations with individuals from the south side but didn't know the details. That same day investigators went to the Leon County Jail to interview Wig. He was asked to provide his whereabouts on the night of June 3rd into the morning of June 4th. Wig said he had visited a group of individuals he couldn't name until 1am when he went home. When shown photos of the white Buick, he denied any knowledge of the vehicle. When confronted with witness statements and physical evidence connecting him to the vehicle, he admitted to taking it during a drug deal. He denied the second shooting where the car was shot, then changed his story to pulling out a revolver after getting into it with a group of individuals, but he didn't fire. He claimed to have disposed of the gun in a body of water. Wig would deny involvement in the Key Street murder, once again changing his story and claiming he checked into a motel that had no record of his stay. Wig then admitted to knowing Witness 3, aka Boston Richie. Wig confirmed him and Richie had a past altercation, but denied Richie's version of events. Instead, Wig said Richie and his brother pulled up on Dunn Street, armed with AK-47 style rifles, and threatened him. 
According to the affidavit, based on the totality of evidence, investigators believe Wig carjacked the Buick, shot up a car, and committed the murder. More specifically, witness testimony also demonstrated that the defendant discussed details of the homicide, attempted to rid himself of the handgun used, and was ultimately told to discard it in a body of water. Witness testimony and the defendant's own statements indicate that the defendant had past altercations with the homicide victim's family members in the prior months, and witness statements indicate that the defendant confessed that he went to the Keith Street residence on the morning of June 4th and that once there, he shot and killed the victim. Each of these pieces of evidence were used to secure probable cause and Wig was arrested for murder. Now I asked Boston Richie if he was in fact witness three. He'd say when the shit took place, they interviewed him first, meaning Wig. He told Troll the person who killed my cousin. He told the police we pulled up with rifles and shit. They took his story and basically said I said what he said just to make him sound guilty to charge him. Richie would then send a picture of Wig's statement and say, this what he told Troll, you feel me? They took what he said and tried to say the same thing on my end like I said it, you feel me? Now not only has Boston Richie admitted to being witness 3, he took to his Instagram posting Wig's statement and said, y'all gonna keep flagging or y'all gonna drop your nuts and speak on some real shit. I don't even post on IG about no street shit. I could have been sent the person y'all praise up shit public records. Everybody no fool ratted on me. I don't be speaking on shit or chasing clout like you jits. I been outside, never been police. Fool, the reason I even became a witness in the case, he told Troll we pushed up with the Blicks. What's crazy is the contradiction in Boston Richie's post. He's claiming Wig snitched on him by telling the police he pulled up with guns. And because of that statement, Boston Richie became a witness. But this is a lie. According to the affidavit, Boston Richie was interviewed by police on June 23rd, the same day he was arrested for loitering and prowling. Wig wouldn't be interviewed until June 29th, six days later. Boston Richie could have at any point in time denied speaking with police and wasn't even being questioned about loitering, which was why he was arrested. Instead, he identified Wig by a photograph to police, told them he'd previously been threatened by Wig, and maintained that the Key Street murder was not a result of the altercation or any criminal gang activity Richie may have been involved in, meaning Richie wanted to clarify to police he had nothing to do with the murder but his sworn statement would make him an official witness in the murder case, and his name would be concealed because the information he provided pertained to a possible motive. His sworn statement would also be used as evidence in finding probable cause to charge Wig with murder. Now Boston Richie is saying Wig ratted on him for telling police Richie pulled up with guns, so that would mean Richie ratted for telling police Wig threatened him. But Boston Richie didn't just rat too, he ratted first. Wig was asked about Boston Richie's statement, denied it, then gave his own. Wig would later plead no contest and be sentenced to 15 years in prison for second degree murder and possession of a firearm by a felon. Now Boston Richie would dismiss the accusations against him as NFL 2 WAP hating and trying to blemish his image. Boston Richie's team would point out that 2 WAP is from the Houghton Street Apartments, the same apartments Boston Richie and Future shot a video at and handed out over $10,000 worth of sneakers. Richie's team would argue if he was a rat, why hasn't anyone done anything about it? They'd further accuse 2 WAP of just trying to gain clout after getting signed to Kodak three months ago. But 2 Wop would claim he got the paperwork from someone in Boston Richie's own hood and exposed it as soon as he got it. Regardless of whose side is more convincing, the paperwork doesn't pick a side, and Boston Richie has more paperwork that's yet to be revealed. In December of 2013, a woman reported her Honda Accord stolen. Later that day, an unmarked police officer spotted the vehicle backed into a parking space on Holton Street, and after a short time watching the vehicle, he observed two black males later identified as DeJaris Robinson and a then 16-year-old Jalen Foster, aka Boston Richie, get into the vehicle and drive off. 
Locating the vehicle again, three males were now inside, changing positions in the vehicle before driving off as the officer once again lost contact. Another officer saw the three black males matching the descriptions given walking away from a dead end street. He'd locate the stolen Honda as another officer responded to the scene where we observed Boston Richie walking away from the other two males. He detained Richie, read his Miranda warning, and Richie agreed to answer questions. Richie advised the officer he was the person driving the vehicle. Questions were stopped at that time and Richie was transported to the Tallahassee Police Department for a continued interview. Officers located the other two men identified as DeJarris Robinson and Kelton Forbes and neither would make any statement to police. Retracing the path they walked away from, police found the keys to the Honda and a stolen Ruger revolver in a garbage can. Investigators interviewed Boston Richie at the police station. Post Miranda, Richie agreed to answer questions. He advised that he had stolen the vehicle with three other juveniles. He only knew one of the juveniles by the name George, and George told him the Honda had the keys inside of it, and they took the car between 2 a.m. and 4 a.m., driving it around until 7 a.m. He kept the keys in his possession the entire day until he returned to pick it up and was stopped by police. He then picked up Robinson and Forbes, who he advised knew that the car was stolen. Richie said he drove the vehicle the entire time until he parked. Richie then advised that Robinson and Forbes knew that the vehicle was stolen, saying they knew he stole the car and that's why they came to his house several times that day. He said he did not have possession of the stolen firearm. He said that when they were walking away from the vehicle, he jumped the fence and threw the keys in a garbage can while the other two suspects were still behind him. He is unsure if one of them threw the gun in the garbage can after he passed it. Now the affidavit states, due to all parties knowing that the vehicle was stolen and their actions depriving the victim of her property, Boston Ritchie, Robinson, and Forbes were all charged with grand theft of a motor vehicle. Now I asked Boston Ritchie about this case and he'd say he took the charges for the gun and car and that's why he went to prison. He'd say I told the police they were in the car but never knew it was stolen because he stole it. He'd even say one of them was his cousin who he was with. But just like the last case, what Boston Ritchie is saying isn't adding up to the paperwork. The affidavit clearly states Boston Ritchie told police he told his co-defendants the car was stolen a total of three times. Because of this, all three teens were arrested and charged with GTA because they knowingly got into a stolen vehicle. Now Boston Ritchie's team would say he was only 16 at the time and the charges got dropped for the other two teens, but in my opinion, it doesn't matter. The two other teens refused to make statements to police while Boston Ritchie agreed to make a statement and his statement got them arrested. So in total, Boston Ritchie has conducted two separate interviews with police, got his own cousin and another teen arrested and gave a sworn statement in a murder case where the alleged shooter was sentenced to prison. Now I'll be honest with you, I'm a fan of the music. I didn't expect all of this. And when I spoke with Boston Richie's team, they damn near convinced me. Oh, he just trying to get clout off of his name. He didn't tell. He said he bumped into dude, but it wasn't about nothing. It ain't like he said he killed his cousin and all oh, the thing about the car. And he was only 16 and you know, the, the charges got dropped, but you can't deny the paperwork, right? When I'm hearing them say it, I'm like, yeah, it doesn't sound like he snitched. It sounds like he fucked up. He shouldn't have said anything to the police, period. But not only that, looking at the paperwork, it clearly states the information he gave, the sworn statement in the murder case, was towards a possible motive. That's what the police were seeking. And they used his sworn statement as evidence towards the probable cause to arrest the shooter. I mean, it's, it's dead and done. I've shown y'all through this video the other snitches in the murder case, which were all the shooter's friends. Murder, what was the other one's name? Loud, his own girlfriend. But the thing about that witness list is Boston Richie is on it. 
Boston Richie's name is with theirs. Everything that every one of them said was used as evidence. And then I find the Grand Theft Auto case. You're with your cousin, your homeboy, y'all get picked up, whatever, their charges get dropped, that's fine. But the fact that you told the police, yeah, they knew the car was stolen, and then you said it again. Yeah, they knew it was stolen, I told them it was stolen. And then you said it again. Yeah, they knew it was stolen, that's why they kept coming to my house that day. The only reason they even got arrested is because you were talking to the police. Because you agreed to give an interview. And you can't say it was because you were 16. Because they decided not to make a statement. It says they refused. You could have did the same thing that they did. So to be a rapper and have given a sworn statement in a murder case that led to a conviction... And an interview in another case that led to two arrests. It doesn't look good. Now looking back at the DMs between me and Boston Richie. It's crazy because he lied. He said that Wig was interviewed first. And Wig ratted on him. That it was Wig's fault that he was a witness in the case. Because Wig said Boston Richie ran down on him. With the AK styled weapon. But it was a lie. Because the paperwork says Boston Richie was interviewed first. And when asked, Boston Richie admitted that Wig ran down on him and threatened him. So if you're gonna accuse Wig of ratting for doing the same thing you did, then what did you do? Sounds like you ratted, right? And I mean, how I look at it, because I'm unbiased with this shit. I was hit up about it. Yo, look into this. All right, I'm gonna look into it. How I feel about it is if me... 1090 Jake, doing the videos that I do, how I do them. If I was a witness in a murder and gave a sworn statement and that man got convicted because what I said was used as evidence to secure probable cause and then I got arrested because I said that my two homies knew that the car was stolen so they got arrested for it too, what would y'all call me? It's 1090 Jake, I'm rocking with y'all and y'all rocking with me. Till next time.